Hi friends and welcome to MBM Online. We're journeying our way through Genesis 1 to 12. It is the blueprint and I love this part of God's Word. Got a question for you. Do you think the world is getting better, staying the same or getting worse? Do you think the world is getting better, staying the same, or getting worse? I don't think it's an easy question to answer because it kind of depends on what you're measuring it by. If we're thinking about technology, oh my goodness, it's getting better. We're making progress exponentially. If you think in terms of environmental damage, we're getting worse. Just the level of plastics in the ocean, in the ocean is enough to keep you up all night. On the one hand, we've got the eradication of slave trading, at least in Western countries and a bunch of other countries as well. But the sex trafficking has gone through the roof. So how do you measure it? Uh, we speak up for children in a way we've never done before in abusive cases. Praise the Lord. But we've become progressively more and more silent about the state of a child in a womb. Are we getting better or are we getting worse? What is clear in Genesis 1 to 12, we're getting progressively worse, humanity. And I'll tell you why. Because the measurement in Genesis 1 to 12 is about how people relate to God. And what we discover there, that from Adam to Cain to Lamech to the generation of Noah, uh, the same story is being played out and intensifying. Sin is spreading like wildfire and getting more intensely evil. Uh, and not even the sheer, sheer annihilation, of the, the near annihilation of the world with the virtual eradication of every living creature, including humans, is enough to fix up the problem. In fact, nothing changed. Noah comes out of the ark and gets drunk and we're back to square one. So by the time we get to Genesis 11, it's interesting that the world has by this stage still one shared common language, but it's pumped up on steroids of its pride, where individuals already have taken God on and failed. Now, the next step here is that humanity collectively wants to take on God. And of course, they're going to fail as well. Now, in the Tower of Babel, humans have developed what sometimes doctors are accused of, having the God complex. Um, I don't say it, of course, but some people say it. Now, you see it in the way uh, they speak. Remember how God said in Genesis 1, let us make man in God's image? But in Genesis 11, verse 4, we read, humans say, come, let us build ourselves a city. So the words that fell off naturally, the words of, sorry, the words that naturally fell off the lips of God are now inappropriately falling off the lips of humans. And not only are they playing God, they want to replace him. Look at Genesis 11 verse 4. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Since the heavens capture the presence of God, you can see the tower into the heavens is an attempt at trying to storm the throne room of God. Yep, it's an attempt at trying to grasp at equality for God, to replace God. You see it in that, in that simple act of Eve when she sought to reach for the forbidden tree, an attempt at grasping at equality with God. It's the direct opposite to our Lord Jesus Christ, who we're told was in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Oh no. But he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being found in human likeness, obedient to his father all the way to death, even death on a cross. And that's why Jesus is the counterpoint to rebellious humanity. Now, the world has come together under one language, to worship God, not in your early, to overthrow him, to make a name for themselves. And what are they doing? They're using the very gifts that God has given them, the ability to build and construct, and they're using it against him. The issue, of course, is not technology. And you know why? Because Noah built a boat to the glory of God, which required a lot of technology. Um, the cultural mandate to subdue the earth uh, involves construction and creativity. These are good things. Uh, even, even in a bad line like Cain's line, you see in Genesis 4.21, that Jubal was the father of all who play string instruments and pipes, that Zillah also had a son, Jubal Cain, who forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. So here, instruments and technology, they can be used to praise God or to curse him. Um, you're either singing, to God be the glory, great things he has done, or you're singing, to man be the glory, great things he has done. Either way, technology is not the problem. In fact, technology actually is a friend of Christ and Christians. Christians aren't supposed to go Amish. You know, think about the 16th century when the printing press was invented. 
It resulted in Bibles being produced rapidly and, and gospel tracts um, carrying the gospel of our Lord spread right through Europe that led to the Reformation. Praise the Lord. Uh, think of the development of the sound system and amplification. It's because of that that evangelists like Billy, Billy Sunday and Billy Graham, in this time last century, were able to preach to large numbers in stadiums. It's because of recordings and radios that we were able to get the good news of Jesus into communist countries. It's because of the internet and satellites that we're able to turn this world into a virtual global village so that um, Muslims in countries where missionaries are forbidden are able to hear of Jesus dying for their sins. Oh no, technology is not our enemy. In fact, let's face it, right now you're experiencing the word of God being read and preached and prayed about. How? Through technology online. So, and I just want to say, um, uh, imagine if COVID came 30 years ago. Oh my goodness, you'd be getting this sermon on paper in the mail, which wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, but I think we can do better. And I, can I just say how encouraged I've been by the many members of MBM and others who have actually just sent the link, MBM link, online link, to their friends. And, and we've had people around the world and throughout the western suburbs of Sydney contacting us, the result of which we have 55 people now attending our Explaining Christianity course. Hey, and it's not too late if you want to join us. Well, the problem is not technology. The problem is this. In the Tower of Babel, the people there defied God's command to scatter and fill the earth. Before the flood and again after the flood, you've got this, this command in Genesis 1.28. Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth and subdue it. But instead of going out, they stayed together and went up and turned in. Um, they resisted the command to fill the earth and violent, uh, um, uh, blatantly defied the living God. Now, Josephus, a Jewish historian, said they decided to go up because they wanted to avoid another flood. And I thought, you know, there's something in that. Humans love using technology to avoid the consequences of sin. But be that as it may, uh, this wasn't just a question of a tower climbing to the heavens. This was about a city standing in opposition to God's will. Uh, not content with calling on the name of the Lord, they wanted to make a name for themselves. This is the pursuit of fame. This is nothing nothing less and nothing more than one word, pride, collective pride. I love the, I love the fancy word, hubris. It just kind of feels right. But in the end, it, uh, men like Abel and Enoch, men like Noah and Abraham, uh, they're the ones whose names we remember and are honoured in the presence of God. Why? Because by faith they trusted in him. Uh, their names are written in that book of life that will be remembered for all eternity. In contrast, the names of Adam, Cain, Lamech, the generation of Noah, lost, objects of pity. It's ironic, isn't it? The city builders wanted to make a name for themselves, but we don't even know their name. All we've got is a word called Babel, which just means, as it sounds, babble, confusion. They're remembered for their foolishness. Well, the Tower of Babel, in one way, it's a funny story because from humans' point of view, the tower is so big, it would have been probably about seven stories high, reaching into the heavens. Wow, jaw-dropping, sense of awe. Uh, and, you know, we've got, we've, we know that experience, whether you're looking at the ziggurats of the middle, ancient Middle East, the pyramids of Egypt, whether we're looking at the Eiffel Tower in Paris, uh, the Empire State Building in New York, or the Burj Khalifa in uh, Dubai. Oh, my goodness, 163 stories high. I didn't go in it, but I looked at it from the outside. I wasn't getting up there. That was too high for me. And it was literally piercing the clouds there is a sense where, my goodness, it is so impressive, so daunting. I'm sure God is intimidated. Except from God's point of view, the funny thing here is, it's so small, God has to come down and look at it. Look at verse 5. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. Rather than being a threat to God and somehow intimidating him, it is funny because he has to come down. It's almost like he's on his hands and knees pulling out the magnifying glass and saying, where is that tower that they're trying to storm the throne room, my, my throne room for? I can't even see that. I don't think it's so small. And yet, in verse 6, we read this. 
The Lord said, If as one people speaking in the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Again, don't misunderstand this. This is not God, this is not God being intimidated. This is God saying, you know, I made humans in my image. Their potential is unbelievable. It's, it, it's extraordinary. And truly, humans have an enormous capacity for both good and, tragically, for evil. This is not just the sin of one man like Adam. This is not just the sin of one family where Cain kills Abel. This is not just the sin of one family line like Cain who produces a lamech. This is not even the fact that every inclination of the human heart is evil. This is that final step where the world collectively is at war against God. And that's why Jesus will often speak, especially in John's Gospel, of the world. The world, he says, that hates me. The world that will hate his disciples as well. You know, we often say we're better together. Without Christ, that's not true. Without Christ, we're often worse together. Uh, you know, when the Soviet Union was forged under the Marxist regime and ideology and brought nations together under its atheistic uh, uh, worldview, uh, and they got together and they, and they built Sputnik, the first space capsule that could take the first cosmonaut into space, the first person into space. And when they got in there, the, one of the first things they said, you know what it was? He says, we've gone into heaven, there's no God. There is humanity united under one language and uh, their first opportunity is to make the statement against the existence of God. Well, we see collective, um, collective rebellion in many forms. There's religious forms of that. Uh, there's political forms of that. Um, anything from communism to fascism, dare I say, our own Western liberal democracy is another version of that, where each... Ideology is promising kind of a version of heaven on earth, a utopia, and each leaving behind a trail of bloodshed to secure their dream, and each one displacing God in their own way, some overtly like communism, some subtly like our own Western liberal democracy. It's interesting, you know, social movements that displace Jesus will do one of two things. They will either peter out and collapse, as so often happens, or they will assert power and become the new oppressors. And there is a price to pay for fame that rejects God. We're going to pick that up in verse 7. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. The loss of one common language is now the judgment of God. And it's got a little grace in it, though, because it's, it's a kind of God's version of issuing damage control. It's an attempt to restrain the evil. It's almost God is holding us back from our potential for evil. Uh, the very thing, ironically, that the humans were running away from, you know, they, they, they wanted to be kept together. They didn't want to fill the earth. They didn't want to be scattered. The funny thing is, it now falls upon them in new levels because they, they were not only scattered physically, they were scattered now socially and personally, so much so that now language keeps us from each other. Um, imagine yourself on a, on a bus or a train and you're sitting next to someone uh, who speaks another language and they don't speak yours and you don't speak theirs. Picture that as I read this poem from Steve Turner. It's called Babel 1970. It's one of my favourite poems. Side by side we sat. Silence by silence we listened. Chained with our within our languages. Gagged with the words our mothers taught us. I strained for something to say, but I knew I could only spill a mouthful of foreign coins, none of which you could spend. This is the sadness of our barriers, the wall between us all, linked sometimes with handshakes and smiles, split often with warfare, man's most popular multilingual device. I love that poem. There are 600, sorry, there are 6,809 languages in the world, not even to mention dialects. 
each one keeping us at a painful distance. Each time you hear a language, not your own, and whenever you hear people talking and you're shut out from knowing what they're saying, it's a reminder that God has issued this restraining device called language to restrain our capacity for evil. We think that if somehow we could all get together and speak together, I mean, the UN tried this with uh, the creation of an artificial language called Esperanto, which died a slow death. But, you know, if we could have the same language, we can communicate, that we'll get on so well. Well, the 20th century was a tragic attempt at this kind of global community, and it produced not one but two great world wars. Oh, we got together all right, and then we got together to kill each other. The internet is, is, is taking it to the next level where we're able to communicate virtually online, never leaving our bedroom, able to talk to anyone in the world and, and that carried along with something like Facebook. And what's been the outcome of that? Slander, bullying. Uh, we've had, it's inspired endless adulteries. Uh, we've had pornography uh, on massive scales. We've had students learn how to build bombs for terrorists and the stories go on. Language was used by God in his grace to basically hold back the potential for evil. Now, there are all sorts of attempts to uh, find counterfeit forms of unity. The Tower of Babel was built on the plains of Shinar. And it's interesting, from those plains came the empire of Babylon. And from the empire of Babylon came the greatest king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar. And what did he do? He demanded all the nations under his power and control to worship his image. There you go, another version. And that's why Babel, and in particular Babylon, becomes a theme right through Bible, uh, right through the Bible as a city in defiance of God. What, as I said earlier, John will call the world. The same world, by the way, that hates Jesus. The same world that God loves so much that he gave his one and only son. Now, it's not that God doesn't want to bless us with fame. You know, in the next chapter, chapter 12, we're going to see next week, where God promises to give Abraham the bless, uh, multiple blessings, and one of them is to make his name great. In fact, every person who follows Jesus Christ is promised to have their name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, written in the blood of Jesus. And it's not that God doesn't want us to unite for a common good. It's just that it needs to be unity on God's terms around his son. Anything less than that is idolatrous. So John 12, 30, 32 says this. This is Jesus speaking. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Ah, that's the unity that God wants. That when Jesus was crucified, it was under the title, this is the king of the Jews. And to make sure everyone got it, it was translated, it written into Aramaic, into, into Greek and into Latin, so that the world will know that the king of Israel is the king of kings and the king of all the earth. And then Jesus rose and on 50 days after his death and resurrection, there on uh, Pentecost, we have the symbolic undoing of Babel. Because there on Pentecost, we have God-fearers from every nation gathered to worship God. Now filled with the Holy Spirit, hearing the wondrous things that God is doing in their own language, miracle, um, now united by a common trust in Jesus Christ and bound together by the gift of the Holy Spirit. Here now is a God-given unity forged not by human pride, but by humble souls who call on the name of Jesus. This is the beginning of the undoing of Babel. And on that day, 3,000 believed, were baptised and were forgiven. And we're told that all the believers were together and held everything in common. Well, that was a taste of what will come, but an important taste. What kept people apart for so long has now been overcome by the precious blood of our Lord Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? You know, this was going to be a new union being forged, but not around one language, but around one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Humans in Babel sought to physically storm the throne room of God, physically. But what we're told is that in the new creation, when the new Jerusalem will come down, God himself will come down and dwell with us here on that new earth. Not this earth, the new earth. So for now we pray, our Father in heaven. But then we'll be saying, our Father on earth, where we will see him face to face. When, uh, you know, when humans landed, when Neil Armstrong 
uh, put his footprint on the on the on the dust of the moon that first time way back in 1969. It was said that for a brief moment the world was united, and the operative word was brief because it didn't last very long. <laughs> Uh, but it was beautiful, you know, and every time you get little expressions of that where the world comes together, in a way, COVID has kind of brought us together in its own strange way. There's something beautiful. It speaks to a longing in the human soul that is a good longing. Um, but what, but what, I wanted, uh, well, what we're reminded of here is that it has to be on God's terms. See, what's the one project Jesus says he is committed to? What is the one project, the one cause on earth that's going to last for eternity? What do you think it is? It's the church. It's the body of Christ. It's his temple. It's his bride. It's his people. It's us. You know, Jesus said, I will build my church and not even the gates of Hades will stand against it. There's your forever people. There's Jesus' project. That's why we at MBM, we are committed as a, in our vision statement to see all people throughout the world, but in particular the western suburbs of Sydney, the multicultural west of Sydney, to see those lives transformed through Jesus Christ to the glory of God, to see them move from death to life, to see them move from immature to mature, and to see them move from this age to the age to come. So I wonder, friends, what are you building? Uh, are you personally invested in your own little personal kingdom or the kingdom of God? Um, as we come out of our COVID hibernation, and it feels like, I feel like we've been hibernated for a couple of months, and I kind of enjoyed a little bit of it, to be honest. But the but what we need to understand as we come out of our COVID hibernation is this. You ready? The kingdom of God is bigger than you. The kingdom of God is bigger than your family. The kingdom of God is bigger than just your friends. And as we come out of COVID hibernation, it's time to take meaningful steps to now reconnect with the people of God. There are dangerous habits that can be formed during this um, hibernation that I've been speaking about. We may have gotten out of the routine of gathering at the same time. We're going to have to learn that again. Um, connecting with your service and ministry teams at church will be an important thing to do at about this time because us coming back together is in the future but not the too distant future. Uh, fellowship with us on Zoom would be an important thing to do. We get about 20% of our congregations a gathering at that time, I want to ask you an awkward question. Why haven't you been with us? And it's not too late. We'd love to welcome you in. The Zoom link comes out every week. And on, and if you just press it, it's only 15, 20 minutes, not that long. We have breakout rooms. It's, gee, it's a fun time. It's light. It's breezy. It's encouraging. Love you to be a part of it. We need to now, as we get out of COVID hibernation, to start doing meaningful reconnections with each other. And to, dis and to get into the discipline of watching MBM online with others and not just ourselves. Because I want to end on this point. The place of God's church in your heart will be a clear indication of the place of Jesus in your heart. I'm going to say that again. It's so important. The place of the local church for us MBM, the place of MBM in your heart is one of the strongest indications of the place of Jesus in your heart. You know why? Because you cannot love Jesus and not love his people. You cannot love Jesus and not serve his people. Let's ponder how God's word has ministered to us right now in prayer. Dear Father, forgive us for seeking to make a name for ourselves for building our kingdom and not yours. Thank you, Jesus, that you came to build your church, purchased by your blood. Help us to grasp that the kingdom of God is bigger than just ourselves, our families and our friends. Help us to grasp that we can't love you, Lord, unless we love and serve your people, the church. In Jesus' powerful name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, let's praise our God, for we are his bride and he is our bridegroom and we love him.